Rich, welcome back to the show. It seems like a long time. Yes, very, very long. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Rich Maltzman has been a project manager, a program manager. He's led PMOs. He's an engineer and he's an academic. So he really has a practical background to his academic uh, skills, a proper pracademic, as he calls himself. Um, so it's great to have you back, Rich. As you know, in this segment, what we're going to do is tackle a question that has come to uh, me from my community, from a real project manager uh, with a real challenge. But I don't want to brief you and let you give a prepared answer. I'm looking forward to hearing your real world experiences. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick a question at random. So we're going to swap over to the, uh, to the overhead camera. We're going to pick one of six questions at random, and then I'm going to ask you to give your thoughts about that. And we'll, we'll try to build up some suggestions for this member of my community. Okay, so here are our six questions, and I'm just going to roll the dice. And it's question number three. So let's just show the audience what we've got there. Are you sure that's not a fortune from a fortune cookie? <laughs> Could well be. Okay, so this, uh, this project manager says this. I have never had to do this before, but I have been told that I need to establish governance structures for my new project. I don't know where to start. Okay. So, Rich, I'm guessing uh, you've been involved in a whole range of different governance structures and a whole range of different projects. So what strikes you as the first thing that this, uh, this project manager should be thinking about? Um, so almost the opposite of decomposition. Um, this is a uh, governance is about the way in which you work policies, overarching policies, um, uh, the way now usually governance is either for a large project, um, or for, a. a, a Large, like a pro, like what some people would call a program or for a portfolio. Mm -hmm. Typically, the word applies there. Not a you know not a single project. I, I would say we use the word ground rules to talk about the way in you know or team char team charter from the new Pimbok yeah. guide a team charter. Yeah, the way so, we work certainly for a, a small project, the governance is your boss tells you what to do and you report to your boss. Yeah, well, or, or or I think even more appropriately for a project manager, your customer has told you what the deliverable is. Yeah. And you're telling the team how we'll work to get to that yeah. to that deliverable. We're going to meet every Wednesday. We're going to do risk analysis. We're going to have a risk response plan, blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of the governance for yeah. a smaller project. And I think that's we should just bank that observation straight away because people sometimes put governance in its own box and they forget how closely it connects to other aspects of project management. And one of those key aspects that it connects with is risk. Risk is yeah. a, just a vital governance issue. Yes. So I think people immediately turn off when they hear the word governance yeah. because it starts with the same letters as government. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so people are thinking, oh, my God, I'm, you know, am I am I a Congress? Am I, a, you know, a, a Senate? Uh, am I a, a president or a or a king or a queen because I'm I'm doing governance? And I think you need to say, OK, no, you aren't. <laughs> You are looking at policies. Mm -hmm. You are looking at um, decision making yep. and guide, guidance for the way in which this set of projects or large project works. So I think the advice I'd give this person, and this is literally like my hair off the top of my head, <laughs> <laughs> um, would be to step way back and look at uh, look at what has gone wrong or right on other projects. Mm -hmm. What kinds of overarching problems have there been in other projects and how can you stop those from even starting to fester in your program? And I'm going to call it program or portfolio because yeah. I think governance is too big a word to apply to, to projects. I, I think the concept makes sense. Hmm. But again, it's more like ground rules, team charter when you're talking about a, a project. Okay. Um, so if you um, talking now to the person with the fortune cookie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who asked the question, um, I'd say the very first step is way back, step way back and look at the project from 50,000 feet. I should say the program or portfolio, um, maybe even push back on the person who made the request to you 
mm. and say, what do you mean by governance? Yep. Clarify the clarify the task. Um, and most of the, and I here I'm on the academic side, most of the literature on project governance is going to be about portfolios yeah. and programs. So check that out mm -hmm. and look at applying that on your project. But it, again, it's all, it's the key word there is going to be about policies, mm -hmm. ways of working, ways of reporting. And as you said, Mike, ways of um, assessing risk, that is going to be a key portion of it, but yeah. don't ignore the communications portion yeah. because part of the part of governance will be how do different bodies in this larger project communicate yeah. uh, it brings to mind the classic uh nasa mars lander example if you know it um where the one part of uh, nasa was using metric uh was using um yeah I'll say the old British system of, of measurement, and the other we were using um, we're using well, one was using centimeters, and one was using using inches. Yeah, yeah. metric and, and imperial. Because, metric and imperial. Thank you. Uh, and because of that difference, and they were both working in their silos, and there was no governance yeah. over um, units of measure, you had a crash. Yeah, uh, you had a very expensive. You know, and I paid for that with my tax dollars. <laughs> um, I paid for us to put a bunch of mashed metal on Mars, yeah. right? Because they just didn't have the governance to to connect uh, all the working teams. Yeah. So, step back, look at the word governance. Go back to the person who made the request and make sure you they're you're clear with them as what they were asking you to do. That word is so general yeah. that if say, hey, go do governance. <laughs> um, it's fair. It's a fair question to yeah. push back and say, "Hey, what did you? What are your expectations yeah. um, when you say governance?" Yeah, and I think the um, you know the communication example is a nice one. And I think there's a, an element that uh, I'd add in there, which is actually it's about understanding who's got what roles and what responsibilities. And a big part, even on a small project, is just identifying who are, what are the roles and responsibilities. And as you say, within the team, ground rules will cover it. Yes, and, in and, fact, a, and a decent, in my, you know, racy chart or linear responsibility chart will cover yeah. it. But as you as you start thinking about, you know, where's how much authority do I have as a project manager before yes. I have to go back to my client, to my sponsor, to my users? Yeah. yeah, in fact, in my in my I have a project, I have a sorry, a program and a portfolio management course, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of one step up from the project management course. And in that course, the students work in groups. And one of their uh, one of the outcomes, because they do a full fledged program plan, is a decision matrix. Yeah. So one of the tools in governance is a decision matrix yes. that's not just limited to the project managers. It's how all decisions are made, and there's guidelines for above a certain amount of money, a certain amount of risk. Um, those are made by this, even down to a person. This person will make those decisions. Yeah. So you know in advance um, where the where the decision making is taking place. Um, which, when you think about it, is really a form of a, of a racy matrix. Yeah. It's a form, and all of that <laughs> comes back to communications. Yeah. I thought you were going to decide that, or I thought I'm the decider <laughs> on that. But no, here it's you've got that in governance. You've got a plan that says these decisions that involve these kinds of things are made by Karen Smith. Yeah, and you know that's the person that does it. That's interesting. You've referred people to uh, you know to, to start doing some reading, and you come from a uh, a PMI based tradition, PMBOT based tradition. And one of the questions I quite often get asked as a, a UK based project manager is, you know, what's, you know, what's the comparison between uh, PMBOK on the one hand and Prince2 manual on the other hand? Right. Uh, and of course, it's a category error to try to really compare them. They, they are des designed to do different things. But um, I think if you are working in a project where you need a lot of governance, whether it's a, whether you call it a project or a program, it's a big, pro a big project, a program. You can argue about the difference, but you're not actually going to make any progress on the project or program while you're arguing. So, but yes. one of the things I would say is whether you, whether you come from a British tradition or in a government tradition, because Prince 2 is, comes out of the government yes. sector, or whether you're working in a highly commercial US business, if you need a lot of governance, there's a lot to learn from the Prince 2 methodology and the resources that that throws up. And I think Absolutely. for me, one of the one of the one of the things I would say that uh, our uh, viewer should be actively thinking about is the gateway uh, process and having gateway reviews. Again, 
and it's also about risk management and it's about communicating to senior people and senior people communicating to you how we're going how progress is being received but i think gateway the gateway process whether or not you having external gateway reviewers external to the project or external to the organization that's that's a whole other set of decisions about roles and responsibilities but having pauses in your project where someone compels you or the process compels you to take stock and think before you go to the next stage i think is hugely valuable and even agile projects have that you know we have retrospectives we have uh yes. new drawdowns so um think about that as one of your key levers of good governance regardless of what sort of project you're running yes and you want to avoid and this is one of the things i just finished teaching you want to avoid the sunk cost absolutely um, yeah. Right. The issue of sunk costs where you have, you know, you get to a point in the project where, you know, we spent a million dollars. We have to keep going. Yeah. That is a human frailty. Um, I just posted about that on LinkedIn, actually, uh, about the I'll sunk cost. Link policy. people to, to your uh, yeah. article on that because it's yeah. it's one of my hobby horses, too. And so, yes. yeah. So can you just give a, 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 a short, sharp explanation of what that term, the sunk cost fallacy, means yes in the context of um, the post actually has a, a nice cartoon to illustrate it it shows a, a it shows a house on fire um and uh you basically you ask the question on a project if i was starting from scratch would i do this project yeah For, if i if i was asked now should i would i continue to do this project would i have started this project and if you say no then that's when you should just let the house burn down yeah. and let the, <laughs> let the project end so uh, i'll use a really simple example yeah and I think I used this one in the in the post. You have attained tickets to a concert. Um, let's say it's post COVID. No, actually, let's make it COVID. It's during the pandemic, and you've <laughs> you've got tickets to a concert. Uh, you spent uh, seventy five dollars uh, on this ticket. You really want to see this band perform, but some friends have gone. It's an older rock and roller, and he's lost his voice, and um, it, it, he's really not that good. And you're not feeling well, and there's been an increase in um, contagion in the pandemic, and you really don't want to go, but you spent $75, yeah. and you've invested. So you go. And he's even worse than your friends were telling you he's, he's been. Um, you really didn't feel good, and you're saying to yourself afterwards, why did I go, right? Um, that's an example of the sunk cost fallacy yeah. that I've already spent the money. I'm going to finish doing this. So on a project, Absolutely. the analogy would be, you know, we've invested a million dollars. There's only um, another million to spend. Let's just spend it and get it over with. Well, you just threw away a million dollars, perhaps. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's throwing good money after bad, isn't it? That's the throwing good money after bad is and, a very short and way I, to do I it. Always, but... The example I give is you spend a million dollars and it will cost you $10 to finish the project. But if you're not going to get $10 worth of value out of that project, then that's right. another $10 wasted. You might as well buy a, you know, a, round, of, a round of drinks. What's, what's interesting about this is when it's been studied yeah. um, psychologically um, by, you know, by, by, by scientists, they find that children and animals don't do this. Yeah. Only adult humans. We're the only ones. <laughs> yeah. We've developed, we've developed a really dangerous instinct. Okay, it's so a waste. Got... It's a waste. It's basically, ironically, going back to, to the whole concept of sustainability. It's our aversion to to waste. We yeah. feel like we're wasting money if we don't finish this off. Yeah. When in fact, you're actually wasting more it's money. The to throw some <laughs> That's more out. The yeah. fallacy. <laughs> so, so we've got quite a lot of uh, elements. Uh, let's just take stock of what we've got. We first of all, I think the splendid advice: just take a kind of step back and view the whole project as a whole, and, and ask yourself what's important here. Uh, right. We talked about roles and responsibilities. We talked about the link with risk. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about actually doing some research. We talked about asking, asking the question, what do you mean by governance? And we've, between us, we've articulated some of the things that we think of as governance. We've, you, I yes. think you've, you've uh, kind of led off with it's the procedures, the processes, the rules to follow. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I would add it's the oversight of those. Um, and of course, it's decision making you've told us. And, and I think we can divide decision making into the big strategic decision at the start, what direction is the project going in, and then the, the day to day course corrections. And then there's that whole thing about levels of authority and the, the responsibility chart that flows from that. Plus the idea of uh, gateways and the 
imperative to not get caught with the sunk cost trap. Anything I've missed? Oh, pretty good. I think that that wraps it up well. This this the, and there are tools and prints. We actually lean on um, a lot of UK government resources in the class. I point them to a whole set of resources that come from um, that or originated at Prince Two. Yeah. In terms of there are actual templates. Yeah. Um, and you should take advantage of those. Maybe we can put those up and I will your, do because uh, I, I I point people to those on my courses too. So yeah. Good. Um, that, that talk about decision uh, decision authority matrixes yeah. and th things like these um, that you can take advantage of. Don't have to start from scratch. Yeah. There are, people have been there before. People have <laughs> people have governanced before you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So Good. take advantage of that. Uh, any last thoughts before uh, before I ask I you? I hope to it's not a last thought. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I, I think you wrapped it up really well. So I think Excellent. that was a that was a really tough question. Yeah. Um, uh, but a good one. And I think we did provide some good advice. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, Rich, thank you very much. Before I let you go, um, how can people get in touch with you if they want to engage with you? Because I know you're always keen to engage with people. Yeah. Um, so as you can see behind me, I'm here in Boston. That's a, a view of Boston University across the River Charles from mm -hmm. Cambridge. So Harvard is behind, no, Harvard is behind me. <laughs> anyway, and you're looking across from Cambridge into Boston. Yeah. Um, but LinkedIn is uh, the preferred way uh, to contact me. Brilliant. Um, I am pretty, um, pretty uh, active a networker and uh, I enjoy um, making contacts with folks. I, people like Mike, they're out there. This, yeah. this wisdom is out there. So take advantage of it. And I'm glad to help in whatever way I can. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look forward to doing that with you. Great. Splendid. Rich Morseman, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>